Um, good afternoon, everybody. Hello again. Um, Christine and I were just saying this is certainly an experiment for me. I, I've years and years, decades of uh, experience lecturing, but never to this kind of audience. So it, it is a bit weird. Now, normally, I, I'm used to a lecture theatre full of students, and they, you know, you can you can look at them and you can see the reaction. Um, so please do use the chat. Um, I think Christine, we agreed that if people want to ask questions. If it's really urgent and you need to stop me, then we can do that. But then we can also pick up at the end. Um, I'm, I'm really relaxed about this. And and, and maybe also just very briefly, um, so this is lecture two. Uh, we're gonna update some of the material because I revised it a little bit and we'll present it as lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, if you want to go and look at my slides and we'll make that clearer. Um, but maybe just two or three minutes to remind you about what we did last time. So um, last time, I introduced you first of all to, oh gosh, this isn't changing. Um, yeah, I introduced you to the concept of synchrotrons, these, these huge machines um, that historically um, were built for high energy physics to accelerate particles to increasing energies and then collide them with targets and each other to smash open the nucleus. And as I said last time, one of the consequences most famous example, of course, being CERN in high energy physics, but in accelerating particles to these energies and getting them to describe circular orbits, uh, one produces this bright parasitic radiation called synchrotron radiation. And for high energy physics, this is just a pain. It gets in the way, you lose energy, you have to keep putting energy back into your storage ring, and you have to shield the workers from it because it's potentially very damaging. But little by little, from the 60s, people started to realize, and here was the first world's first facility that was built to generate synchrotron radiation, not parasitically for high energy physics, but because people started to use it. From that point onwards, um, across the world, there was the development of dedicated synchrotrons to generate brilliant, coherent light, mostly in the form of x-rays. And I took you through some of the developments in technology that extracted even more light from a storage ring. Um, told you a little bit about the advantages of uh, synchrotrons, not just being bright, but tunable. So you can get synchrotrons that generate infrared radiation, ultraviolet, but most of them generate um, uh, x-rays from the soft all the way through to the hard region of the spectrum. And then finally, we ended up talking a little bit about the various ways in which X-rays interact with matter. And I divided them up into three types. Um, and we'll go through these in more detail in this and the next two lectures. So if you direct X-rays at materials, at a material, first of all, they can excite the electrons in that material, and you get a variety of processes, mostly uh, fluorescence processes, but these give rise to the collection of phenomena that we call spectroscopy or techniques. Um, secondly, those X-rays can be scattered, mostly elastically, and that's the basis of the technique of diffraction, which is the, is the, is the foundation of crystallography. And both of these techniques, the spectroscopic techniques and the scattering techniques, the phenomena that give rise to them, um, reduce the intensity of the X-rays going through the sample. So what you get out at the other end uh, is an X-ray beam that has been attenuated, and that's the basis of most imaging techniques. And I took you through imaging. We, we saw the historic Rontgen picture, his wife's hand, his wife's ghostly hand, and now to the modern day where, you know, a thousand million times brighter beams can be used to generate very high precision, three-dimensional images through tomography. And when you add the coherence of synchrotrons, um, you can also image uh, soft tissue. And I gave you this example of the, the eye of the bee and the, the insight into the cells. And then finally, at the end of the last lecture, we started to look at the fundamental uh, effects that underpin all of the, the measurements that I'll take you through. And the, the, the fundamental effect here is the Thomson effect. It's the interaction of the electric component, uh, and there are other interactions as well, we'll come to later, but the electric component of the, uh, of the photon beam, the, the electromagnetic wave couples with the electrons in the atoms in your material. And this effect is stronger uh, as the number of electrons in the material uh, increases. So what we find is this so-called Thomson effect is much stronger for a heavy element such as lead compared to a much lighter element like carbon or, or even hydrogen. And as we'll see, uh, and as, as Matthew would be able to chip in if he was 
be, be joining me in this. Uh, we'll also see that neutron scattering provides a wonderful complement to X-ray scattering um, in being able to pick out these much lighter elements in structural studies. Uh, and then finally, we, we looked at a little of the con few of the consequences of the Thomson effect. Um, we saw that, um, yes, the, the, the absorption cross-section um, goes up very strongly with the atomic number Z as the number of electrons increase, uh, and the absorption also drops as the energy of the X-rays increase. So perhaps counterintuitively, if you shine X-rays, for example, at living tissue, a person, it's much less damaging if the X-rays have very high energy compared to very low energy. They couple much less strongly um, with the materials. And then finally, the last, right at the end of the last lecture, we started to look at these these discontinuities that you see in the absorption cross-section, so-called absorption edges, um, which arise, as I've said, because the incident X-rays can excite electronic transitions in the material from the, the most tightly bound core levels, the, the N equals one K shell, all the way up through uh, less and less tightly bound levels. And all of these give rise to photoionization events, the, the ejection of electrons through high energy photons into the vacuum, into free space. And then finally, and, and we'll go through this, we'll slow down now and we'll, we'll look at this in a bit more detail. What happens next? And what happens next um, after you have uh, excited the atom with high energy X-rays is, well, you leave behind, you see here, uh, an atom that has got a hole in one of its core electronic states. That's an unstable configuration of the atom and it has to relax and it relaxes by one of two ways. Um, the most common way, and it's the basis of the technique known as X-ray fluorescence, is that a, an excited, uh, a higher energy electron rather, drops into this core level and it gives, round, gives out X-rays and that's X-ray fluorescence. And that is characteristic of the particular element. It's a fingerprint for the particular element you stay um, observing. A second effect, and it's we, we'll, we'll just mention it, but we won't explore it in any detail in this course, um, is that excess energy can be carried away by exciting a, a secondary um, electron. So there's a second photo ionization um, event, and that's the so-called Auger effect, which is stronger for lighter elements than heavier elements. But the, 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 the most commonly used and the most commonly observed effect is that of X-ray fluorescence. And X-ray fluorescence, is, is bound by very strict um, rules, so-called uh, selection rules. So those of you who've, who've done a, um, uh, an undergraduate degree already in chemistry and perhaps also in physics will be very familiar with the rules that constrain the transitions that are allowed. Um, and I've, I've tried to illustrate that in this, this diagram here. So in, a, in, an, in, a, in an electronic transition for an atom, Transitions from any principal quantum number, um, M or L shells to, to another shell, they're all allowed. There are no quantum mechanical limitations on the change in the principal quantum um, number N. But the, uh, the angular momentum quantum numbers do have constraints. And, and you may recall, if you've done, as I've said, a chemistry degree already, um, that the, the orbital angular momentum quantum number L has to change by plus or minus one. So for example, a, a P electron uh, can go to an S state, but an S electron can, can, cannot go to an S state. So the orbital angular momentum quantum number has to change by one. The spin angular momentum quantum number, the spin associated with each electron must stay the same. And the overall uh, angular momentum, which is the combination of the spin and the orbital can change by zero or plus or minus one. So what we see, uh, and we'll just stick with this diagram on the left here, is that these relaxation processes of high energy electrons down into empty core states, um, only certain of these transitions are allowed. Um, uh, and we label these according to uh, the, the letter of the, of the shell. So for historic reasons, you may recall that the highest energy transitions um, uh, correspond to um, the K shell, the most tightly bound electrons. Um, so transitions uh, of electrons back into this, this, this lowest lying state um, are, 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 are the K lines. And if we look at the ones that are allowed, S to S is forbidden. Um, the lowest energy transitions that are allowed are the, 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 the two, two P transitions uh, corresponding to total, or total angular momentum 
one half and three halves. So there are two lines and it doesn't really matter what the labeling is, but there's a labeling convention. The next uh, energy transition back into, down into this K state is now from the M shell, which has the principal quantum number three. S to S is forbidden, P to S is allowed, D to S is forbidden. So by applying the selection rules to the well-known energy levels for the particular electron, uh, for the particular atom rather, you can predict a, a series of um, spectroscopic fluorescence lines. And this is exactly what uh, uh, Henry or Harry Mosley, who's pictured here on the right hand side, um, observed. He was the first person to observe and rationalize um, fluorescence. He, he was a remarkable person, actually. He, as an undergraduate, he, he went from just having got his um, degree in Oxford to work for Rutherford, then in Manchester. And Rutherford put him on to studying what happened when you exposed different materials. This was around about 1910, um, 1912. What happens when you expose different materials to cathode rays? These are high energy electrons. And Mosley observed, first of all, that they fluoresced in the X-ray region. And then he built a rather simple spectrometer. And this is just a, a simple um, representation of where he saw these, these black like these black bars here are where he measured the emission of X-rays as a function of wavelength uh, in a variety of um, uh, materials, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese uh, samples, and also some, um, some alloys. And the alloy brass, which is a mixture of copper and zinc, um, contains lines that match exactly, you can see here the copper lines, and unfortunately he didn't record zinc on this spectrogram, but had he recorded zinc, the lines missing from brass would have been the lines from zinc. So he, he first of all observed that the different chemical elements have completely different fingerprint fluorescence lines. And more than that, he also established a relationship between, actually in his case, he, he established it between the energy and the atomic number of the element. Now, at that time, the periodic table was known, or rather many of the elements in the periodic table was known. Mendeleev had proposed it. But it wasn't certain what the underlying basis of the periodic table was. And there was one school of thought that said the elements in the periodic table are arranged according to their atomic weight, uh, roughly the number of protons and neutrons. And other people have said, no, it depends on the atomic number. And what Mosley demonstrated here is that the fundamental um, building block or the thing that determines uh, different chemical characteristics actually is the elemental, sorry, is the atomic number here. So this, this measurement not only established fluorescence as a fingerprinting technique and as a technique in its own right, but it also um, consolidated our understanding of the, the underlying structure of the periodic table. Um, sadly, um, uh, Mosley was one of that generation who were devastated in World War I and died uh, just a couple of years later in, 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 in combat in World War I, is one of those people who almost certainly would have got the Nobel Prize uh, for this discovery and lost to science was, was, was tremendous. Um, and we'll talk about the applications of X-ray fluorescence in much greater detail um, in about two lectures time. But just to say that with synchrotrons, you can excite um, these, these, these electronic states to give rise to fluorescence. And here are just two modern examples that we'll look at in greater detail here. So on the left-hand side, this is work done by Joanna Collingwood in Warwick University in the UK. And what she's studying with her group is the relationship between um, uh, brain disease, various uh, neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's uh, and Huntington's disease, and the distribution of elements in the brain. And one of the things that she discovered is if, if you look at uh, abnormalities in the brain associated with Parkinson's disease, and you, you, you perform the elemental map, and these, these maps can be made at the levels of parts per million or parts per billion sensitivity. Fluorescence is a really sensitive technique. Uh, one can map out the distribution of elements in the brain. And in this case, um, it was observed that where you have Parkinson's disease, you have a deficiency of copper. Now, is that cause or is it effect? It's, it's not clear, but this gives a really direct uh, fingerprint of the elemental distribution. And, and essentially with synchrotron X-rays where you can tune the energy of the source and you can also uh, um, you can also select the energy of the, the light that comes out. You can essentially scan across almost the entire periodic table, limited only by the energy of your X-rays um, for, the, for, the, for the very heaviest element. 
And then on the right, an example from chemistry and one that we'll, we'll look at in greater detail or we'll look at things like it. Um, this is studies of a, of a catalyst, catalyst uh, where the active ingredients contain molybdenum or, or platinum. And again, uh, one can perform and we'll see the 3D mapping three-dimensional mapping of the distribution of individual elements um, within within uh, small particles. You can see the scale here, like the, the, the scale with the cells, it's just 10 microns. And now we can perform sub-micron microscopy um, to produce elemental maps. Now here, this just picks out whether there is, <laughs> excuse me, the element molybdenum or platinum. But actually, as we'll see in a couple of lectures, you can also determine whether it's molybdenum in a particular oxidation state in a particular chemical entity. So the highest resolution modern uh, synchrotron spectroscopy measurements can tell you what chemical species you have there in three dimensions with some micron resolu resolution. What any chemist would love to do, I used to be a chemist once, is then use that to follow the course of a chemical reaction and see the chemical uh, entities change uh, as a function of time. And, and that is just starting to come in and starting to become a reality. Okay, so, right, what we'll move on to now is to look in greater detail at the application of these two fundamental phenomena uh, arising from the interaction of X-rays with matter. One is scattering and the other one is, is, is the variety of spectroscopic processes. Now, um, uh, again, this is sort of, <laughs> An unusual situation for me. Normally in a university, I would know exactly what you've been taught before, and I would know that at this stage in, in this course, you would understand the principles of crystallography or not. I'm going to assume that most of you understand the basic principles of crystallography, um, but just in case, I'm going to just remind people of some of the principles uh, and also establish some of the terminology that, um, that, that we'll use, partly because the terminology does change a little bit between disciplines. So whether you're a chemist uh, or a physicist or a material scientist, you might use slightly different terms to describe some of the, the concepts that I'm going to, um, going to present now. But anyway, in a nutshell, um, the, the elastic scattering, coherent scattering of X-rays um, uh, by the atoms in the material is the most incisive technique to tell you where every single atom is in the in the in in in, in the in the structure of primarily crystalline materials, and synchrotrons provide a particularly incisive way to do this because of their brightness um, uh, and because of their ability, as we see later, to tune the energy. Um, so we can perform crystallography with synchrotron X-rays in ways that are much more powerful than with a conventional laboratory-based uh, um, uh, diffractometer. And just to remind you of the origins, so, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think now, probably 200 years ago now, there was a debate about whether light uh, took the form of particles or waves. Newton had said that light is composed of particles called corp cor corpuscles. Now, it took a very brave person to try to demonstrate that actually light was not in the form of particles, but was in the form of waves. Newton was, you know, this colossus who, you know, decades after his death, uh, was still regarded as as, as um, uh, essentially infallible. But a young, uh, youngish uh, British scientist called Young said, well, let's just imagine that um, light takes the form of waves and not particles, as the great Newton has said. If light behaves like waves, then we should be able to observe interference between two different sources of light, just as we observe interference between the ripples on a pond where we excite two different sets of ripples. Um, I was supposed to have a picture of a pond here, but you can imagine intersecting ripples and where the peaks intersect, they double the peak and where a peak and a trough intersect, the two cancel one another out. And Young's experiment was very elegant. Um, he, he devised uh, two uh, light sources um, by shining a light at two holes or slits in a box, and he, 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 he predicted that if light has a wave-like form, then the light emerging from these two slits in the box should uh, interfere with each other constructively or destructively. And he predicted that what you would observe in a screen on the other side of these slits, excuse me, uh, would be an interference pattern. And that's exactly what the so-called Young split experiment did. So it was, it was, it was the first definitive proof that light had a wave-like 
form as we see later on it has both a wave-like and a particle form they were sort of both right but perhaps different reasons um, but anyway the point is that um, throughout the 19th century the 19th century arguably in physics was the was a century of, of uh, wave-like um, interpretation of matter uh, or interpretation of phenomena rather um, um, when x-rays were discovered um, people were aware it was some form of electromagnetic radiation. Um, but there was this young uh, uh, German physicist uh, called Max von Laue who said, well, look, if X-rays are a form of electromagnetic radiation, we ought to be able to get them to diffract just as Young got light to diffract with, with his um, double slit experiment. And what you need to do with the Young slit experiment, you, you, you need to set up slits whose separation is similar to the wavelength of the light. That's when you get the interference between the, 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 the waves of the two light sources. So what von Laue reckoned was, well, if we can take an object which has got slits or holes or spaces in it, whose separation is similar to the wavelength of the radiation, we should be able to see a similar kind of diffraction um, uh, effect. And the, 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 material that he chose was was a simple crystal. He, re, he re reasoned that the separation between atoms in the crystal, which is of the order of 0.1 nanometers, was comparable to the wavelength of the x-rays that were then available to him. And lo and behold, when he exposed uh, a crystal uh, to an x-ray source, he got this pattern of spots. And that proof that x-rays had a wave-like form, one uh, von Laue, the Nobel Prize in Physics, um, at, at, at the start of the, towards the start of the, the 20th um, century. Now, he got it simply, I say simply, um, for demonstrating that X-rays had a wave-like property. The next step was actually using that uh, property to tell us something about the structure of materials themselves. And it was the Braggs, William and William, um, fortunately they had some middle names, William Henry and William Lawrence, father and son, um, who took that observation one step further and they demonstrated the relationship between the structure of the crystalline material, the disposition of atoms in that material and the wavelength of the light being, being scattered. So we now know very well um, that the nature of the scattering, and here's the, here's the crude experiment, um, one of the, 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 the then X-ray sources, which is produced by accelerating um, electrons onto a metal target, generating X-rays um, through uh, a hole in an in a, in a absorbing material, as we've seen from the Thomson effect, a heavy uh, element such as lead, allows you to direct um, a beam of X-rays onto the sample. Um, the Braggs took sodium chloride as a simple example to begin with, and from that they got a pattern of spots. And what the Braggs were then able to do is to use that information, and we'll see what, how they did it in a moment, to tell them about the structure itself. I should say, by the way, that when, when they first started doing this, it, was, it caused an uproar. You know, nowadays, we, sodium chloride is something we, we, we learn you know, right at the start of our courses of, of, of structure of materials. Um, my kids are doing chemistry at the moment, you know, at the age of 13, know all about the structure of sodium chloride. Sodium and chlorine ions regularly spaced in this, in, this, in this cubic lattice. But at the time, the chemical intuition told them that sodium chloride would have little molecules of sodium bound tightly to chlorine dispersed somehow in the material. And Bragg and Bragg demonstrated that sodium and chlorine were equally spaced and it caused a huge controversy. You should read the literature at the time telling, you know, sort of, almost accusing the, the Braggs of destroying this chemical molecular idea of, of the structure of an ion and material like sodium chloride. It's, it's really quite interesting to see how the, um, how the establishment initially rejected the findings of crystallography, but in the end, they, they, had, they couldn't deny that it was a measurement, an irrefutable measurement, even though it went against, went against the then intuition. Okay, so a little bit of reminder, perhaps, uh, about some of the basics of, of crystallography. Um, so, the scattering of X-rays from a crystal produces this pattern of spots that you saw in a von Laue um, picture. Um, we sometimes call them Bragg spots or, or reflections. Um, the position of the spots is determined by the nature and the size of, of the unit cell of the crystalline material. And the intensity of the spots is, 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 is determined by... Um, ooh, sorry, there's a bit of background noise. Um, the intensity of the spots is determined by the distribution of the electrons. 
Um, am I still am I still visible, Christine, or audible? Yes. It's okay. It's okay. I need yeah. To Good. Super. And again, just as a reminder, um, there are only a certain number of different or unique ways in which you can fill space with solid objects. There are seven different ways, these seven primitive unit cells. And then there are a number of additional ways in which you can distribute points in space or 14 different um, crystallographic systems, the so-called Bravi lattices. So, um, so the, 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 the spacing of the spots is determined uh, by which of these 14 crystallographic um, uh, cells uh, are, are uh, the, the structure crystallized into and what the size of those cells are. And then of course you develop the structure as you know by distributing actual atoms within these unit cells with fractional coordinates. Uh, fraction, those atoms are then located or they're referred to as fractions of the length, the coordinates in relation to fractions of the length of the unit cells. So the individual atoms I, um, and we'll, we, we, we're pinning all of this down because I'll start to quote formula, formula in a moment. Uh, uh, individual atoms uh, are defined within the unit cell by fractional coordinates, X, Y, and Z for each of the I, um, I atoms. So first of all, there's the, there's the position of the, the spot or, or the reflection. And what, what Lawrence Bragg demonstrated, and I think he's still the youngest ever Nobel laureate uh, in physics, I think he was 22 when he established a relationship, he, he, he likened the diffraction um, process to the coherent reflection of, of x-rays of, of neighboring planes in the crystal. And the basic idea, as many of you will know, is that you get constructive interference when this ray uh, reflecting off one plane um, is, is, is in coherence has, has uh, is separated in path length by an even number of uh, wavelengths from the ray that's reflected off the adjacent um, uh, crystallographic plane. And there's a simple bit of trigonometry. You know, this, this path difference um, is 2d sine theta, and it must be equivalent to an in integral number of wavelengths. So n lambda equals 2d sine theta. The Bragg equation is one of the most quoted, well-known, uh, um, formulae in all in all of science and that's essentially the, the basis of the relation between crystallographic plane spacings which in turn tell you about uh, the dimensions of the structure um, and the the angle through which the x-rays are scattered so by measuring the position of these spots you can get the angle two theta and from that you can get the plane spacing d and as we see a little bit later on from that you can um, you can deduce um, the size of the unit itself and there are essentially two types of experiments here one is we, um, we uh, select out of the x-rays that come from the tube. Um, so the x-rays coming from the tube have a spectral distribution. And um, we can select with a device called a monochromator, something that turns uh, a spectral distribution into just light of one color. Um, uh, we can select just one wavelength. And if we set that one wavelength, we fix the value of lambda in the, in the, in the Bragg equation. And then by rotating the crystal, um, uh, so that uh, the, the planes, a particular set of planes are, are lined up, we can observe a reflection uh, at that angle two theta. So, so one, one method is to use monochromatic um, radiation. And I should say, incidentally, the simplest way to make monochromatic radiation is to place between the sample and the source a, a crystal uh, at a certain angle. And what that, what that crystal placed at a particular angle will do is only select from the beam uh, photons whose wavelength satisfies the Bragg equation. So it's a simple monochromator. Alternatively, and this is the technique that um, that, that one of our um, uh, I was going to say audience observers uh, uses, uh, uh, Matthew, is to take a polychromatic beam now, um, and um, with a polychromatic beam, of course, uh, there are, there's a selection of, of wavelengths. So if you, if you have a crystal, then as that's rotated. There will be various conditions, um, there will be various angles at which different um, uh, planes give rise to reflections for that distribution of, um, of wavelengths. Now, that gives rise to many, many more spots. So there's a wider range of uh, uh, wavelengths in play. Um, there's a wider range of, of um, uh, angles at which the, the Bragg equation is satisfied. You get many more spots in your pattern, but that information uh, allows you, there's, there's, there's much more information in your pattern, but you have to be able to select from your spots. Um, you have to know 
of your spots which which um which corresponds to which wavelength and that's something in in synchrotron x radiation is something we can discriminate against with with with, with detectors and then finally so the last bit of, of the reminder of crystallography if you like is just to remind ourselves about the way in which we label uh, the different spots or, or the different reflections. And this is using a system called the Miller indices. Um, and the Miller indices are all about defining particular planes in your crystallographic system. And of course, uh, for different sets of planes with different Miller indices, you get different uh, 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 ways of satisfying the, the Bragg equation. So just to start off with a rather simple cubic crystal, the way in which you perform the construction, uh, and well, let's just start with this top left cube. Um, you can imagine a set of planes, um, the, the, the base set of planes go through the origin, which is this point here, uh, and the, the, if the, if the, <clears throat> the adjacent plane um, uh, in, in the first example I'm going to um, show you is, is depicted with this shaded um, face here. So this is a plane um, which cuts the, the C-axis um, at, 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 at the, the unit cell uh, length. So this is the fractional coordinate is one. It's the whole unit cell edge. Um, and it's parallel with the, the B and the A axis in the cubic cell. So it's, it never ever intersects. It's parallel to it. So it, it never intersects the B um, or, the, or the A axis. So the intercept with those axes is actually infinite. The way in which we define the Miller indices is in terms of the the, um, the fraction of along each axis of the intercept of that plane. So for example, this plane here, it intercepts the C axis um, at one, um, but it's parallel to B and, B and A, so the intercept is at infinity, and one over those three numbers is zero, zero, one. So the Miller uh, index of this particular plane here uh, is zero, zero, one. Likewise, uh, this, this plane here, which intercepts um, the A axis now at one, but it's parallel with B and C, uh, is the one zero zero and so forth. And then we have more complex um, configurations. I'll just look at this one here. So the, the set of planes, which are perpendicular to the long diagonal of the cube, um, uh, you can see them here and here, there's two planes. You've got a, a plane going through the origin. The next plane uh, goes to intersects the A, B and the C axis at one, one and one for each axis. So this becomes the one, one, one plane. So you can see that it's a, a relatively simple labeling system that allows you to unambiguously define every different uh, set of planes uh, in the material. And, and there, there are simple geometric relationships which you can just look up, but experienced crystallographers carry them in their head. So for example, any um, crystallographic system where the A, B, and C axes are perpendicular to one another in a cube, uh, in, in, an, in, a, in, a, in an orthorhombic system or a tetrahedral system, for example, there's a very simple relationship that also allows you to calculate the D spacing between the planes. And then once you know the D spacing between the planes, you can just plug it into the Bragg equation. So um, in the case of crystallographic systems where A, B, and C are perpendicular to one another, um, the relationship is just that one over the square of the, the spacing between the planes is, is the Miller index H squared over A squared plus K squared over B squared plus L squared over C squared. So simple geometry uh, and the knowledge of the labels of the planes allows you to very quickly calculate the despacing and then from that calculate the angle at which the, um, the diffraction condition um, uh, will, will be met. And then finally, just for the sake of completeness, because we'll, we'll come back to this in a couple of lectures time, and some of you may already be familiar with this, um, it's sometimes convenient to think of diffraction in terms not of real space, but of what's called reciprocal or Fourier space. Um, and in this reciprocal space, um, and again, it allows one to very quickly visualize where planes are, what their directions are, and what their spacings are. Um, we define a set of axes um, in, in, in this uh, Fourier or reciprocal space, such as the axis A star is perpendicular to B and C, B star is perpendicular to, to A and C, and C star is perpendicular to A and B. And to give you an example, um, here's a, 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 a cartoon of part of a hexagonal uh, crystallographic system. Um, so in the hexagonal system, this would be the A-axis. Oops, sorry. This would be the A-axis. This would be the B-axis. So A star, 
is perpendicular to, and, and the c-axis is coming out of the, the screen as you're looking at it. So A star is perpendicular to B and C coming out. So this is the A star axis. This uh, axis here is the B star axis. So if you look at, if you wanted to very quickly figure out where, oh, I don't know, the one, one, zero planes were in this, in this crystallographic system, in, 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 in real space, these are planes that go through the origin and then intersect with A and B uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the, the, the unit cell length. So these are planes which would go through here and then the next set of planes would go through here. Now, it, it turns out because of the way in which we constructed the reciprocal lattice, the perpendicular to these planes is along a reciprocal lattice vector, which is the one one vector. So the one one planes are perpendicular to the one one vector in, in reciprocal space. So the reciprocal lattice gives us um, a, a very quick and ready way of imagining where all the crystallographic planes are in terms of their the, the perpendicular to those planes. And again, that's extremely useful and quick in visualizing the um, the nature of the scattering that you would get off these cells. Of course, nowadays all of this is is done by computer and so forth. But I think it's it's actually important, you know, to to understand the origin of the scattering and 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 actually to be able to do some of this by hand um, uh, and certainly when when you know when when i was an undergraduate when i was an experimental scientist um, where you did have to manually line up crystals understanding the relationship between the 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 edges of the the, the real crystal you're trying to line up and imagining where the scattering planes were in that crystal it was it was it was very useful to be able to just write down graphically where the reciprocal lattice was, and then from that be able to calculate exactly where you expected the scattering to be. Okay, so that's that um, uh, tells us about where the spots or the reflections are found um, uh, and what their spacing is. And then of course these spots also have an intensity associated with them. Now you think back to the um, to the Thomson effect, the scattering from the individual atoms is a consequence of the scattering from the electrons. Actually, it goes as um, uh, the, the strength of the Thomson effect goes as z squared. Um, uh, uh, and, and actually, what we measure in an X-ray diffraction pattern um, is a consequence of the scattering from all of the electrons um, in the material, and in particular, the distribution of the electrons in the unit cell. Because if you know the distribution of the electrons in the unit cell, and you know the fact that the unit cell is just repeated in space, then you, you know everything uh, there is to know about the, about the structure. Um, and the, the, the strength of the scattering from an HKL plane is then proportional to the sum, sum of the scattering from every atom in the unit cell. So the, the scattering from each atom uh, in the unit cell is known as the atomic um, scattering or form factor, uh, and the, the sum of all those scatterings is, is equal to the sum of the scattered wavelets from each of the atoms within the unit cell, and this is called the structure factor. So for a reflection with the Miller indices f of hkl, the structure factor is just this, this is, the, this is essentially the expression for the sum over all atoms j in the unit cell of the scattering from each atom um, multiplied by what we call the phase. And this is really just a description of the scattered wave uh, from uh, each atom within, within the unit cell. So the overall scattering, and this is just a, again a cartoon, the overall um, scattering amplitude of the, uh, of the, of the X-ray wave is the result of the scattering from uh, atom one, uh, and then with a different phase, uh, scattering from atom two. And then if the unit cell only has three different atoms in it, then the um, uh, strength of scattering from uh, atom atom three. So the, the overall scattering strength is, is the sum, the vector sum of uh, the strength of each, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, strength from each atom in this in this vector diagram, where the 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 change in the vector between each one reflects the the different phases of the scattering from each um, uh, from each atom. Now, in a in a diffraction experiment, we don't measure the amplitude of the scattering; we measure the intensity of the spot or the scattering, and the intensity is proportional to the square of this. Um, uh, uh, quantity here. And what that means, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail later on, 
is that if we only measure the square of this, um, we, we, we no longer know if there's a plus or a minus sign in front of that. Minus f squared is equal to the same as plus f squared. So we've lost a piece of information in measuring the intensity rather than being able to measure the amplitude um, of the scattering. And this loss of phase means there's a critical piece of information missing when we measure the intensity and we want to work backwards because ultimately what we want to be able to do is to Fourier transform this to work out where uh, what the electron density is and where the atoms are. Uh, and we'll see a little bit later on that synchrotron radiation gives us a real, really powerful way to solve the phase problem. Um, we'll come to that in a moment, but so, so everything I've said so far, it applies to X-ray diffraction in, in general. The question is, you know, why do we bother going, why do we bother going to a synchrotron to do these measurements when, um, the, the principles are the same for our laboratory-based uh, X-ray diffractometers, which are fractions of the cost of going to synchrotrons. And we do that because synchrotron X-ray uh, diffraction gives us a number of critical advantages of what you find in, in, in the research lab. So we've already seen, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll have some good examples a little bit later on, we've already seen that synchrotron X-rays are particularly bright, and that means we can focus them right down uh, to fractions of a micron. So we can look at regions of a sample. Um, you might have a sample that contains a collection of individual crystals, um, which might be slightly different from each other. Um, so we can look at very small samples or regions of samples, although we note in passing that these X-ray beams are so bright that they will damage soft, softer organic samples in no time at all. So it's typically when you put a protein crystal in the beam, it will be destroyed by the X-ray beam in, in, in a matter of seconds, sometimes fractions of a second. But within that time, it's possible to take, excuse me, enough information to deduce the, the crystal structure. Um, the, the brightness also means you can, you can gather this structural information often in a fraction of a second. And now the state of the art is such that um, with, with some of the, the brightest sources and fastest detectors, you can measure the structure of materials within about a milli to a microsecond. So you can start to look at structural transformations. I mentioned in passing incidentally yesterday, that there's, there's yet another technology which I wasn't going to explicitly include in this course, which is called a free electron laser. Uh, and that enables us to measure uh, structure uh, at timescales below a nanosecond. So you can look at even faster dynamics and you can start to look at some of the really fundamental uh, processes that determine function of biological materials, for example. But even with synchrotrons, you can start to look at structure down to, um, down to microseconds and look at real uh, chemical and biological transformation. You can tune synchrotron X-rays up to much higher energies. So I've already said that you know it would not be unusual to produce synchrotron X-rays at about 100 kilovolts and sometimes more. And that means you can look at structure deep inside materials, um, uh, buried, buried materials where you know it might be a, a, a an engineering uh, material, a, a dense piece of metal, uh, and you might want to look at the structure deep within that piece of metal, or you might want to look at the structure of a particular chemical compound within a chemical reactor and the x-rays can penetrate the walls of the chemical reactor and then um, be scattered by the sample deep held deep in that in that sample holder so um, and a typical laboratory x-ray only has uh, um, uh, photon energies uh, up to about 10 kilovolts typically um, we saw in the um, the absorption cross-section from the end of the last lecture that the higher the energy of the X-rays, the lower the absorbance, so the, the better able the material is to, to penetrate. Um, we can tune the energy of synchrotron X-rays. We can tune them through the absorption edges that we, we, we spoke about at the beginning of this lecture, and we'll see that that's critical um, in, 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 in solving the phase problem. And something I don't touch on in this course is because X synchrotron X-rays have a degree of coherence, we can also look at very, very small deformations at larger length scales in, in, in complex crystalline materials through, the, through using that um, coherence. So before I really look at the, the application of synchrotrons to single crystal diffraction um, and solving the save problem, phase problem, I should mention in passing that an awful lot of the systems that we study uh, at synchrotrons and at neutron sources cannot readily be grown as single crystals. It's often the case 
that the hardest part of doing a, a diffraction experiment is growing the sample. People take literally years, sometimes a decade, to uh, produce crystals of, uh, of particularly challenging um, uh, systems. For example, in the field of structural biology, uh, there are materials called membrane proteins. They're naturally the materials that you get in this, the gelatinous systems in cell walls. By their very nature, um, they don't naturally crystallize and people have to use very clever techniques and a lot of patience to get them to crystallize. So it's often the case uh, that in biological systems, but also in chemistry and material science, that it can be very difficult to grow single crystals for single crystal studies. And there are some systems like metals, you know, um, bulk metals by their nature are almost always polycrystalline systems. The, the, you know, the, the piece of metal you get in a, a conventional piece of iron or steel, yes, is a solid object, but it's built up of many little grains and crystallites um, with randomly oriented crystals within the bulk material. So it's very common to also try to have to determine the structure from a material which cannot be produced easily in form of a single crystal, and instead have to deal with a polycrystalline or a powder sample. And let's just imagine what the consequences of that are for a diff diffraction experiment. Um, I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, I'm just going to, if I can find my mute button, I was going to cough, but, um, uh, uh, okay, sorry. <clears throat> so what I've tried to depict in the, um, in the cartoon on the bottom left here is the difference between scattering from a single crystal and from a collection of crystals. Scattering of a single crystal gives us a discrete collection of spots. Uh, and this, for example, is just the, the collection of spots that you might have from a particular crystallographic plane, uh, uh, some of the x-rays being scattered to one side and some to the other. Now imagine that your sample um, was a collection of hundreds and hundreds of little crystals, all of them randomly oriented in the powder. What you would find instead of two discrete spots, you'd have two spots per crystallite, but they're now all randomly oriented. Um, the, the, the angular deviation, the two theta in the Bragg equation will be the same for every crystalline for a particular um, uh, set of planes, but their rotation angle would be, would be random. So what you see instead of a collection of discrete spots now for a, a, a sample of randomly ordered crystallites in the powder, is now uh, a set of rings and the rings are composed of the spots, the diffraction from each um, crystallite in your powder. And, but it's still the case that the angular, angular deviation two theta from the incoming beam and the scattered beam is, is that that you find in, in the Bragg equation, n Landry equals 2d sine theta. So the measurement in this case normally involves integrating the intensity around each ring there should be a circular symmetry if you've got enough crystallites, and then plotting the intensity, if you see in the bottom right here, uh, as, an, as a function of the angle two theta. Uh, and each of these, these peaks has a well-defined form that is determined by, uh, by the geometry of the, of the diffractometer and also um, uh, the nature of the, uh, of the powder. Um, and what this means is, within this so-called powder pattern or powder profile, there's generally enough information to, well, first of all, the particular pattern you get is a fingerprint of uh, the crystalline material that you're measuring. So different crystalline materials will each have a unique uh, diffraction pattern. Well, sometimes there are things which by accident are very similar, but when, when you make these measurements with very high intensity, high resolution X-rays, generally you can, uh, you can produce a unique powder pattern fingerprint for different uh, crystalline materials. So first of all, it's a fingerprint. Uh, if you want to check against a, a standard sample that your unknown is, is compound X, this is a great way to do it. Um, and it also allows you to determine uh, or refine the structure of a material that's related to a known material. Um, so for example, if you've made a material and you change a particular atom in the material, it's sometimes the case that you'll get a new material which is, 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 is just slightly different from the, the original material uh, from which you have changed, uh, changed the atom. So just to give you an idea about what, what we do, here, here's a powder diffractometer, a diamond, but it could be true of any 
um, uh, powder diffractometer or the synchrotron pretty much anywhere in the world. Bottom left, you've got the X-rays coming in from the synchrotron ring. They're directed to the sample. It's too small to see it here, but there'll be, there'll be a powder held in a very fine glass capillary tube to present it to the beam. And then the X-rays are scattered. So if this is the, the angle, the straight through angle, uh, then the angle two theta is this angle um, that goes from zero to 180 degrees. And the scattered X-rays are then collected in this bank of, of detectors, um, either uh, in this particular case, a, a bank of detectors, which allow you to, to measure very small changes in angular distribution, or this is a much coarser resolution uh, 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 detector on the bottom, but allows you to make the measurement much more quickly. So <clears throat> this kind of diffractometer allows you to either do very precise, um, high resolution experiments or very quick and rather dirty or very imprecise measurements where you, all you want to look at is rapid changes in crystallographic structure. And then associated with this, and this is, this is a, a feature of a modern machine, you, know, you can make measurements within a fraction of a second sometimes. With a, with a diffractometer like this. Um, and in the good old days, you know, real human beings, research students would come in and they would, they would place their sample in the beam. They'd go outside the hutch. They would lock the door because of course it'd be full of x-rays. They'd make the measurement. They would come back in again. They would take the old sample off and put the new sample on and they would repeat that. And that could take minutes to, you know, just the process of changing the sample, lining it up, going out of the hutch again, um, pressing the, the shutter, taking, uh, more data. Nowadays, we do all of this in an automated fashion by robot. So what we have here uh, is a standard robot um, developed from the sort of bit robots you get in the car industry, but particularly um, tuned for our purposes. And beside the robot, there's a carousel, which will hold hundreds of samples, each of these glass capillaries. And the robot's able to pick the, the capillary up sample by sample, change it very rapidly in the beam in a matter of seconds, precisely, rapidly, safely, because of course robots don't mind being irradiated with x-rays up to a point. Um, so the, there doesn't need to be any particular human intervention in this measurement. And actually nowadays it's the case, uh, and it's perhaps a little bit sad and takes a lot of the fun out of it, uh, you've even got clever software that can work out when you've taken enough data, is your diffraction pack good enough, the robot can now actually, well, the software behind the robot can now actually decide when to finish doing the measurement and go on to the next measurement. So in principle, you can load up your, your, your carousel of hundreds of samples, go away, press go, and come back, um, oh, I don't know, a day later, and you'll have 200 samples measured. measured. It's, it's still more reliable to look at the data off each one and decide when you've, you've gathered enough data but but the point is that the speed of measurement is so quick now that you need this automation to um uh, to make to make the best use of, of the time so what you get out of this what you ultimately you get out of this is you get one of these fingerprints a it can tell you yes you can confirm you've got a, a known material and b you can take that structural information and you can model it with a computer and you can refine small changes in the structure from um, I don't know, the parent compound, or imagine you take a material and it changes um, structure slightly under chemical transformation. Well, you can, you, you, knowing what the starting structure is, you can then model um, how that structure might change with different chemical changes, compare it to the measured pattern, and then model, refine the model against the, the measured data. So this refinement technique allows you to determine structure based on a known uh, model compound. So here's a couple of examples. Um, uh, uh, this is an example of the study of a process to make a, 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 um, uh, a doped iron, um, uh, it's, 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 it's a form of iron, iron carbide engineering material. Um, the reaction involves taking uh, an iron compound, a particular salt, iron nitrite, with an organic material, which is a source of carbon, in this case gelatin, heating that under nitrogen and seeing the, the breakdown, the degradation of the, uh, the iron salt ultimately to make iron carbide. And what we see um, as we heat the sample up, if you look at the right-hand diagram, it's, you can see that the, the powder pattern, and this is just part of the powder pattern, here, this is the angle two theta. Um, there's much more information, but we're just we're just focusing in on a particular region, which is characteristic of the changing um, changing structure. As the material undergoes a chemical transformation, 
first of all to iron oxide or a form of iron oxide, then to an iron nitride, and finally to an iron carbide, um, you see this changing powder pattern. And then in principle, you can perform this, this modeling, this so-called Rietveld refinement, and you can determine much more precisely exactly what is the structure of this, this, this iron carbide. So it allows you to follow a chemical process um, in real time, and then dig down deeper and determine the more precise structure of the material at each at each stage. So you can see that this is starting to be used in following and elucidating uh, manufacturing or chemical uh, processes. Uh, two more examples. Um, I, I have given this course in Manchester University. Um, one of the rising stars there is Sihai Yang, um, who is working on so-called metal um, oxide, uh, metal organic, sorry, metal organic framework compounds. Um, cartoons here depict that. So these are materials which contain large organic molecules and uh, metal atoms. And it, it's almost a black art how they're formed. But let's just say there are ways of putting together these organic molecules coordinated around metal atoms to make these very large, open, um, highly porous structures. So some of these related materials occur naturally, like zeolites, highly absorbent, absorbent materials that are, for example, used in babies' nappies to absorb moisture, um, but are used for, for an increasingly wide, wider range of high-tech purposes. Uh, and among other things, what these very porous materials can be used to do is absorb small molecules, in this case, carbon dioxide, and then when the carbon dioxide is absorbed, do chemistry on them. So if they're combined with catalysts, these are highly efficient, highly selective systems to transform molecules, catalyzed molecules, to transform into a different in, into a different form. And what's critical to chemists is to know how does the carbon dioxide go into the material and how does it change when it's in the material. And actually, this is a, a lovely example where the combination of neutron, and we'll see why neutrons are useful, and X-ray diffraction is is necessary as complementary techniques to tell us about, uh, well, the X-ray measurements tell us about the very subtle changes in the structure of the porous material, and the neutron measurements tell us more about uh, the behavior of the carbon dioxide within the molecule. But anyway, at this stage in the course, um, uh, these measurements uh, were of, of, of powder profiles enabled the researchers to follow the structural change in the porous host during the course of a reaction which carbon dioxide went into the system and then was chemically uh, chemically transformed. Again, a, an example of chemistry in motion. Um, and then finally, um, and we'll, 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 we'll pause in a moment actually, I'll, 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 I'll just do one slide on the single crystal diffraction and we'll pause there as a, an appetizer for next week as it were. Um, this is an example of powder diffraction at a synchrotron being used to follow a fast reaction um, so the system here is, 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 is a chemical that starts off on the right hand of this diagram here. It's a layered iron compound. Uh, for those of you who are chemists, it's, it's iron selenide, it's an iron chalcogenide. These were generated a huge amount of excitement about 10 or 15 years ago because they were discovered to have superconductivity, superconducting properties at relatively high temperatures. And their superconducting properties depend on the extent to which you can chemically modify this material by inserting uh, lithium ions, not unlike in lithium ion batteries, and ammonia in the structure. And again, the question is, how does the lithium and the ammonia go into the structure and how does it modify it? So again, what you might want to do as a chemist or a material scientist is follow the course of this reaction when you um, expose iron selenide to liquid ammonia containing lithium. And that's exactly uh, what Simon Clark, Simon the professor at um, uh, at Oxford, who is actually my first PhD student, did. Here, here's, here he's doing his chemical experiment, classic glass uh, tube um, uh, into which he's going to uh, inject the, um, uh, the ammonia. Uh, liquid ammonia needs a, uh, uh, cooling conditions. Uh, and then putting that chemical reactor in the X-ray and the beam. And as I said, the X-rays 
in the synchrotron have the advantage because they're so high in energy, they can just go straight through the reaction flask and you can perform the diffraction experiments in the reaction flask through the glass. You could do it through metal as well. And what Simon was able to demonstrate was he was able to measure, and I'm just gonna set the movie running in a moment. So he was able to follow from the moment that the ammonia was injected into the system with the lithium, the structural transformation of the material as a function of uh, time and reveal new phases in the material that come and go. So in a, in a conventional um, laboratory-based X-ray uh, measurement, what you might do is measure the structure at the start of the reaction, then do your chemical reaction, and then gather your product and measure the um, structure at the end of the reaction. What you fail to measure is the intermediate steps, the intermediate compounds you form part of the way through the um, through the measurement. So finally, 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 let's ha 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 we'll, we'll finish in a moment. We'll finish with a problem, uh, and next lecture we'll come up with a solution. Um, so I mentioned a few slides ago that in an X-ray measurement we measure the intensity, which is the proportional to the square of the structure factor for a particular reflection f of h k l, um, and we lose the knowledge of the phase of 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 f of h k l. Is it plus or is it minus? Uh, and losing that piece of information means that when we try and work backwards, and in 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 analyzing diffraction data, what we what we try to do is perform. For those of you who are comfortable with math, mass a Fourier transform of the diffraction pattern. The Fourier transform of the diffraction pattern is the electron density. So the electron density is this mathematical operation um, performed on the structure factor uh, 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 for every single um, reflection uh, um, H, K, and L. And because we don't know if this is plus F or minus F, we, we're missing a critical information. So we can't directly perform this transformation. This is the, the crux of the, of the phase problem. Now, it, it so happens that um, nowadays with powerful computers, if you have a simple structure with only a few atoms in the unit cell, you can essentially guess your way out of this problem. So let's say for the sake of argument, we don't know if it's plus FK, F of HKL or minus F of HKL. Well, if you've got only a few atoms in the unit cell and only a relatively small number of reflections, you can say, we don't know but let's just guess that this one's minus and this is plus, and then you just go through the permutations. And there are other constraining factors that you can apply, but to cut a long story short, these brute force or so-called direct methods with very powerful computers um, can now crack um, uh, the structure of relatively simple uh, uh, compounds with a small number of atoms in the unit cell. The problem um, when you come to try and solve um, uh, the structure of a wider range of materials, particularly the sorts of materials that um, are, are the stuff of life, um, complex uh, biological systems, here the ribosome, these are materials that can have hundreds of thousands of atoms in the unit cell, and it becomes impossible to crack the problem with so-called direct methods. And in the next lecture, we will look first of all how traditionally chemists worked with biologists um, through chemical substitution to crack the structure, taking advantage of the fact uh, that the scattering from heavy atoms is much stronger from the scattering from light atoms. And the, 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 the clue to the way to proceed is if you substitute in your biological material a natural, so Biological molecules in general only contain, naturally only contain light atoms, typically up to sulfur, um, uh, which is not a particularly strong scatterer. If you can substitute some of the sulfur atoms for a much heavier atom, such as selenium, which has similar chemical properties, selenium sits underneath sulfur in the periodic table. What you now find is the scattering from the system is strongly perturbed by the scattering from these substituted heavy atoms. And we'll see in the next lecture that this was the classic way of cracking open the, 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 the structure of um, com more complex biological molecules. And what we'll see is that synchrotrons allow you to do this directly um, uh, uh, without having to perform necessarily quite 
uh, as many chemical substitutions. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish there just noting in passing that this is the kind of work that provided, was the basis of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2009 to um, Adionath Venki uh, Ramakrishnan and Tom Stites for the structure of the ribosome. And again here, um, yes, they use synchrotron x-rays to crack the problem, but also a critical part uh, of the work was actually getting the stuff to crystallize um, in the first place. So um, one of the messages I want to leave you with is while synchrotrons provide wonderful, uh, uniquely powerful tools to crack some of these problems, it's often the things you have to do around it, like grow the crystal uh, and develop the automation and as we'll touch on a little bit later make sure you've got enough compute power that together allow you to solve these 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 complicated chemical problems or problems in general and christine i think i will stop there i've been going for about an hour i'm happy to um uh take any questions and if there are any complicated crystallographic questions i'll pass them over to matthew that's a good so yeah, very good. So, so shall I unshare? I'll unshare. I'll unshare. Next time I'll get a glass of water, I think. I'm parched. Well, at least we cannot share my screen. So, yeah, so that was a very comprehensive and uh, complimentary talk. So we're really progressing well. So excellent. So we had, uh, I don't know, maybe, um, Akorede, do you want to ask a question? Uh, is, is it okay? To ask the question because I see that. Uh, yeah, yeah, fire away. So I've got Akka ready here. Yes. Sir. Yes. So, uh, so my question is on um, metal organic frameworks. So, how can um, facilities at diamond lysos be used to study collapse of uh, metal organic frameworks to glassy states? Ooh, now that's a really good question. Um, something I haven't touched on, in fact, I wasn't planning to touch on this, is how you look at the structure of glasses. So, so if you want to look at the collapse, that's relatively straightforward because you know you put your crystal your 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 moth, um, your crystalline material in the system, and then you would. It depends how you're trying to collapse it. Is it by heating it? Is it by exposing it to a chemical? What what's the what's the collapse? What 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 causes the collapse? By, in your, by, in your... by heating. By, by heating. heating. Okay. Yes. So, 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 yeah. So typically, what you would do if you, if you remember that picture I showed you of the diffractometer, it happens to be I11 at diamond where the sample will be a little glass capillary tube. If you want to look at chemical transformation, then instead, you, if you wish to, you can put into the um, X-ray beam a little chemical reactor instead of a, a glass tube uh, or a heater. So nowadays, um, and I didn't complicate that particular slide with it, you can put all sorts of things in the beam, enable you to, to enabling you to do chemistry or heating the sample up. I mean, usually it's just some, something like blowing a hot gas over with a temperature controller. And then what you'll start to see is, um, is, is, is the breakdown in the crystalline structure. So instead of seeing that lovely sharp peaks of the, the powder diffraction pattern, you'll start to see the peaks getting broader and diminish intensity as you lose the crystallinity. Um, but, the, but the next stage, if you want to understand, I don't know if this is something you do want to understand, if you want to understand what the glassy structure should be, that's a lot harder. Um, and let's just say that it's possible to use X-ray diffraction and neutron diffraction to develop an understanding of the, uh, the lower degree of order that you get in, in glasses. Um, but it's, it's, it's much more difficult to get precise information. Um, if only because you, you know your structural problem uh, has got a lot more disorder and randomness in it but but if you wanted to also look at the structure of the glass in principle you could do that and I, i'm not planning to touch it on this course but there's a um, um there's a technique called pdf analysis pair distribution function analysis that allows you to look at structural information in glasses as well D does that help answer your question um yes yes and um, I have a, a second question. So um, the second question is, um, for a researcher working outside the UK, how can you remotely collect data from um, diamond like source? Ah, again, good question. So um, the first thing you need is you need to get access, right? <laughs> you need to get your sample in our beam. And that's, uh, we have a, an open international peer review process. Um, and that means either you as a researcher can, if you look at our, 
website, but this is true of any synchrotron, look at the website, they will describe how you ask to apply for time, okay? And, and normally that's a twice a year process. And um, then if you're successful, um, you get your time. Um, and it, it, if you simply want to look at the structure of a, I don't know, a powder sample in the beam, all you have to do is mail it in and we will stick it in that carousel and the robot will put it in the beam and measure it. And you can watch it from anywhere in the world. Um, so almost 50% of my users uh, perform their experiment remotely. Um, so they could be sitting and, you know, the funny thing is the, the, the university with the greatest number of remote users is Oxford, which is the closest university to, 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 to Diamond. But um, I don't think that almost no structural biologists, for example, come to Diamond physically anymore. They mail their samples in and the robot loads them and they, they follow them. However, if you wanted to do your experiment, which is to heat your moth and watch it collapse, you probably want to set your your equipment up in person at Diamond. And it's probably best if you physically come and do that. But sometimes if you develop a relationship with one of our scientists, the scientist will set it up for you and then you can run it over the internet. Um, but yeah, uh, half of our samples are now run over the internet remotely from anywhere. We have Brazilian users, we have Australian users. We have users in, in, in South Africa, in Cape Town, who, who use Diamond. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It will still depend on the quality of uh, as well of the, the sample, as you said. So this is maybe, is it a risk so for, instance, for him, for, for Kevin Eddy, to have send a sample and then to Shouldn't have be. Um, the good result? Or? Shouldn't be. I mean, the, the kind of systems that you're talking about, Akaradi, I, I guess at room temperature, they're pretty stable. You know, you can stick them in the mail. Uh, in a in a in a glass tube, and normally what we do is we tell you, you know, there is a standard sample holder. Um, so we would typically either send you the sample holder, and you can put it in our sample holder and ship it, or we will define it. And you know, in, in X-ray diffraction, um, the use of glass capillaries is pretty standard. They're, they're just standard things. Um, for protein crystallography, these are samples that usually have to be shipped in liquid nitrogen. Um, but that's standard now. We we um, we actually organize the mail in, so we will send the we will send the liquid nitrogen dura our liquid nitrogen dura by dhl to your lab if you want to run a protein crystallography sample you put your your sample in the dura and it's shipped back and that's just um that's a standard process now we 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 we, we measure thousands and thousands of samples from across the world all the time um with with standard sample holders um, the downside is we lose contact with our users. So we'd like users to come after COVID-19 because otherwise we don't actually meet you guys. Um, and an important part of the science is actually developing the collaborative relationship with, with people. So if what you want is not just a measurement, so in protein crystallography, it's usually just a measurement. It's, it's become very routine. But if you want to do the kind of measurement that you described, which is looking at a chemical transformation, that takes a little bit more collaboration and working together. And, and, and that's, um, uh, that's where actually forming the relationship with our scientists is, is quite important. And I think it's much more rewarding as well. So that could be really interesting. So uh, are you in, um, engaged in a university? Could it be a scholarship potentially as well or, or something that could be related as well, for example? already for bringing up his sample and have this collaboration as well? Or, or how does that work? Are there any kind of uh, restriction or? Not or really. I mean, we, we, we're, we're, we're open to samples from everywhere. Um, if you need to travel to use Diamond, uh, we, we pay travel and accommodation from anywhere in Europe. Um, and we're looking at making that more of a worldwide service. I should say as well, incidentally, so, you know, with COVID-19 um, and restrictions on travel, so despite what I said about we like to see users, at the moment it's just not possible. We're not allowed to have users on site. Um, and what that has meant is we've developed a lot more of remote access met methods. So if you need to collaborate with one of our scientists, um, the, the working relationship at the moment, and I think to some extent, in some cases, it will stay like this, is you develop that relationship, but it's a relationship like this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you, I don't know where you are, you're probably south of the equator, I don't, I don't know, you're, I'm assuming you're somewhere in Africa. Around the equator. <laughs> okay, 
right so but you know at this level it doesn't matter you and i could be working together right and and all it needs is that if i'm a che I'm, I'm a trained chemist right and if i understand your problem and we work together to develop a reactor to put in my beam then we can it, it you know it's better if you're in the hutch beside me but we we've, we've developed ways of working um across thousands of miles where you, you know we, we talk about the experiment like i would put the stuff in the beam but it would be having discussed with you how that should be done um, and i think we will continue to work like this remotely to do more complicated experiments with users even after COVID-19. Um, I, I think we will be traveling less and we'll be doing more of this remote collaborative working. But I still, I'd still like to see people, you know, in my facility um, working side by side one day, sometime next year, perhaps. So very good. So that's uh, really good to see as well this efficiency, which is increasing even through the COVID now by trying to find as well new solutions. Yeah. So we have so more questions uh, here that pops out really nice. Uh, maybe from uh, Samela, so do you want to ask a question? Because I think it's really interesting uh, looking at the multidisciplinary aspect. Huh? Yeah. Um, so Samela, it kind of depends what your structural, what the structural change you want to look at is. Um, and this is perhaps where I will get Matthew. And so we are fortunately having our audience a, a proper life sciences crystallographer um i mean follow changes in the protein structure um it kind of depends what you want to do but let's just say, let's just say for the sake of argument you have a protein structure that is sensitive sensitive to i don't know humidity or ph um then it would depend on the time scale um but you can look at processes that take place uh, up to milli or even microseconds. If you want to look faster than microseconds, then you probably um, have to start thinking about doing measurements at something like a free electron laser, and that becomes a lot more difficult. But if it's but if it's a slow transformation, you know, if it's your protein responding to different levels of humidity, then then uh, over I don't know minutes or hours, that's really quite straightforward. The only thing I would say is that when you perform a protein crystallography experiment at a synchrotron, you generally destroy the sample. So what you're more likely to try to do is to have a sample with one level of humidity and you make the measurement, then you change the humidity on the second identical sample and you look at how it responds. Um, as you'll see with neutrons, because neutrons are non-destructive, um, it's more likely that you'll be able to see such changes without actually damaging the crystal. Samela, is it something that uh, then you it gives you some new ideas as well in terms of how to process? Yes, for sure. <laughs> the more I learn about this area, the more I want to continue working with it. It well, has so Samela, many possibilities. And Samela, if you're you say you're in Brazil, right? Yes. So so the Brazilian synchrotron Sirius mm -hmm. just started running a year ago. So, so yes. you have in Brazil a next generation, you have a fourth generation synchrotron. Um, I mm -hmm. can't tell you where it is. All I know is it's in Brazil. Um, and, 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 <laughs> and, and you, you have a strong life sciences community and you, you'll find that there are people there who, who are doing these kinds of measurements. Um, so, so we, we, you know, we used to take samples from Brazil. Um, I have, I have a life sciences, um, uh, uh, principal beamline scientist from Brazil, and he's all linked to the Brazilian community. So, um, so you have on your doorstep, oh, maybe not on your doorstep. It depends where in Brazil you are, um, but you have a synchrotron that you can access as well, and it's absolutely state of the art. Yes, we're very happy with it here, but Good. collaborations are always needed, right? Sure, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So that, that's the interesting aspect as well with the X-ray, but then for instance, for the, the, the powder, for the powder diffraction, that's also could be some kind of technique that could be interesting when we go now for the neutrons or later on, you will speak as well about that. Yeah, I'll part. talk. Yeah. It could be some ways maybe to benchmark or to find as well some, uh, some, some good technique that are simple enough in order to be able to reproduce. 
And, and what you find is one of the areas where you profit or benefit from co-location of synchrotrons and x-rays is particularly in powder diffraction. Mm -hmm. um, there's about 10% of all measurements which use both of those techniques. Um, there's a particularly strong overlap in, in powder diffraction. Because as you will see with neutrons, the sensitive, you know, I, I've tried to demonstrate with x-rays, the scattering goes up very strongly as the atomic number increases, which means that it's almost impossible to see protons with x-rays. It's not impossible, but you don't get, you don't locate them as precisely. Um, with neutrons, you, the location of, of, of um, hydrogen or deuterium is, is, is an absolute strength. Deuterium as well, yeah. So that, that gives another possibility as well to be having complementary motion, right? Huh? So that's yeah, really absolutely. Cool. And then we have maybe that's uh, quite interesting. I don't know if uh, Anemi, so you are still here. Yes, uh, you're indeed from Tunisia. So can you because he's speaking fluent French as well? So what about we test him and ask question in French? You <laughs> <Mais> know, <laughs> mon accent c'est terrible. <laughs> Please, no, 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 no. Please uh, I have a question also. Fabian. Oh, yes. Fabian. Yes, yes. Please, uh, uh, can we apply also in the field of particle physics uh, this, this distraction in the case for of the muons, pions, or electrons? So, so um, I mean, this is this is Christine's area, not mine. Actually, she's the high energy physicist here. You, you are, you're the accelerator physicist. Um, uh, straight, straight answers, Fabian. So there are, there are international collaborations for these facilities like CERN um, uh, in, in, in a number of big laboratories all over the world. So, so the answer is yes. Um, something that I was going to, oh, excuse me, my, my kids are coming home from school. It's about to get noisy in here. I'm gonna to have to stop in a moment. Um, uh, so one of the things that are often generated at neutron facilities are muons as well. And muons are also used as a probe of matter. But if you're talking about muons and pions and subatomic particles in the field of high energy physics, then it's a, it's a very different field, but it, 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 it uses the same sort of model of international collaboration. And as I said, I think Christine could speak more knowledgeably about the, the nature of, um, of organizations like CERN and Fermilab CERN and Fermilab, indeed, but this is mainly indeed for, for colliding physics. So maybe the goal yep. at the end is a bit different and maybe the requirement are different. But then what we're looking for instance, for the neutron, for the example of for the, for the, for instance, for the, the neutrino or for the antineutrino. So that kind of a beam that are as well planned to be designed yep. because, the wing or because the capacity as well of uh, those neutron shorts. So it could be interesting as well material for that. But then looking yep. at uh, so the, for the, the pion, uh, well, I guess it's indeed for with ISIS or with RAL, so there are quite some different development for the muon collider, for instance, it's a mice yep. uh, experiment. So, so they are doing quite a lot of... Uh, of uh, this is muon catalyzed processes and so forth, yes. Um, and as I said, ISIS, they have a very powerful muon. There are a few facilities in the world. ISIS is one, the facility in um, uh, Switzerland, PSI, that are very powerful muon facilities as well. Um, but this is a much less rare, this is a much rarer phenomenon. Um, Christine, every, I'm gonna have to go in a moment, but I just noticed, so Samela, um, yes, I'll be, I'll be talking more about x fluorescence later. Um, I hadn't planned to talk about infrared spectroscopy, but um, uh, I can certainly give you some reference. It's a, it's a particular strength at Diamond, actually, using infrared spectroscopy as a molecular diagnostic technique. It's particularly powerful, for example, in looking at carcinogenic tissue because the molecules in the carcinogenic tissue are sometimes changed in a way that the infrared beam can, can pick up. Um, but we have a we have a very strong infrared beam line at, at Diamond, and and this is an area where there are not all not all synchrotrons have a have an infrared beam line. I would say less than fifty percent. Um, so I I could probably just give you some references for that. Um, I wasn't I'm afraid I wasn't planning on talking about infrared. Another course perhaps, Christine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but uh, with reference, this is as well a single good way so that um, the the different. Uh, Lecture can be complimentary. And then the question okay. French, we will for next time then. Okay. So you yeah. have a I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm really gonna, to I'm gonna have to <laughs> yes, no problem.
Okay, and cool. Matthew was there thanking you and then our heart. So very good. So Matthew could help as well with the answer on seminar. So that's excellent. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for that. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not a structural biologist. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a materials chemist so um but i've picked up a lot of it from my colleagues uh, half of what we do at diamond is structural biology and half is materials science and physics that's how it works out roughly okay lovely um, nice to see everybody or not see everybody you know you're out there um look forward to engaging with you next um tuesday okay so the next time will be tuesday at the same time so that would be very good and everything should be tonight uh, as well in the server so and if you have any questions feel free to uh, to send email and we'll try to find ways as okay. well if something is needed thanks cool. so lovely bye. thank you everybody bye, bye for now next week bye thanks thank you. Bye. bye bye thank, thank you, you. and i see that caddy is here as well <laughs>